So, in the absence of Maharaj, I'll start. And then, Kanchan Bala, you have something you want to say? Okay, if you allow me just first to be short. And, uh, let's see. So, I'm going to read my uh, obeisance to Sri Prabhupada in my little poetic form. Namaum Vishnu Badaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschadadeshatarade Om, I bow to A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada whose mission is to teach the art of purely serving God. To Krishna no one on this earth can be more dear than he for at Sri Krishna's lotus feet he dwells eternally. Obeisances to you, O prime disciple of your Lord, Sri Saraswati Thakur, wielder of the preaching sword. By preaching Lord Chaitanya's words, you've saved these Western lands from voidism, impersonalist creeds, and all such shams. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs> now what I'd like to share with you is a, uh, eight verses glorifying Srila Prabhupada. This was written in 1978 by Kushikrata Prabhu and Jayatir Das at that point. He gave some ideas and Kushikrata put it. He, he could not only translate Sanskrit, but he could also write Sanskrit poetry, which is very interesting. So I'm just going to give the first verse in Sanskrit, then I'll give the others in English, which I put into a uh, poetic form. Shri Srina Vadvipa Parapradipa Sandipyamana Satato Bhuviha Namami Tam Shri Prabhupada Devam. The tr then I'll go through the eight, and then I'll uh, expand on how Srila Prabhupada manifested these qualities, and then we'll call him Mother Kanchanbala, unless Maharaj has arrived. The transcendental lamp of Navadweep, Garanga Dev, he took with great endeavor round the world the souls to save, who long had dwelt in darkness, never chanting Krishna's name. Through Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. The sacred treasure left by Vyasa and other learned saints he rendered into English, free of speculation's taints. And thus he mercifully fulfilled Sri Saraswati's aim. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. The brilliant sun of Lord Govinda's form is shining bright. The brilliant sun of Lord Govinda's form is shining bright throughout this world because of his sharp logic's awesome might. That sun makes all the Mayavadi glowworms hide in shame. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. The pristine Ganges of the Bhagavat flows everywhere because of his great effort. In that stream, the sages' prayers are gems, and Krishna's pastimes are swans sporting unrestrained. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. Ensuring that his mission's victory would be complete, he planted Sri Sri Radha Krishna's charming lotus feet in temples by the dozen and in countless hearts unchained. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. The fierce and formidable army led by wicked Kali is being slain by arrow showers, volley upon volley. Those arrows are his all auspicious books of spotless fame. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. The Hare Krishna movements of desire tree whose fruits are all the splendid ways, are all the splendid ways Lord Gora's army wins recruits. To plant that tree upon the earth, from Krishna's realm he came. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. An ocean of compassion he has taken shelter of, Srinanda's son with all his being and everlasting love. He lives on by his words, whose followers with him remain. To Srila Prabhupada I bow, his glories I proclaim. I pray that those who hear this hymn, which shines the brilliant light of Srila Prabhupada's renown in Kali Yuga's night, will soon attain firm faith in his instructions, so that they may one day join him in Golok and there with Krishna stay. So that's my little attempt at <laughs> So I'm going to go through each one of these and give a little explanation how Prabhupada fulfilled them. So the first one is that you know, he, he took the transcendental lamp of Navadweep, Goranga Dev, Lord Chaitanya, uh, around the world with great endeavor. And why? To save the souls, to save uh, as many souls who could possibly receive the, the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Who had long dwelt in darkness, never chanting Krishna's name. 
So this was the the uh, probably the most. Uh, <laughs> There's, there's a wonderful uh, book by uh, Bhakti Vikas Swami in which he is glorifying Srila Prabhupada. I forget the name of it, but in the short uh, essays. And one of them is all about Prabhupada just getting on that boat and Jaladuta and coming to America. How that, that was such a, a critical uh, event in world history and certainly in our history. Now, what would we know about Krishna if Prabhupada hadn't taken that leap of faith and gone onto the boat, risked his life, and come to America to give us the holy name and Krishna's uh, instructions. So that's, uh, he, 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 and he took that, that uh, move, he made that, that incredible uh, uh, effort because of his spiritual master's order that he received when the first the minutes he met, met him in 1922 in, in, in uh, Calcutta. And then, of course, Lord Chaitanya's own prediction that his name would be chanted in every town and village all over the world. So without Srila Prabhupada had full faith in those words, they empowered him to uh, succeed in his incredible uh, effort. So then, a, a good part of his uh, mission was in writing, writing literatures. As we know, uh, he didn't make his move until he had those three books of the, of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam printed. Uh, which was a great victory. I, I know what it's like to uh, pr uh, produce a book and to do it all alone. And you remember Kanchan Bala, how it took a big team in Boston and in New York and in L.A. to produce all the books. And Srila Prabhupada was all alone, you know, and he somehow typed out on with two fingers the, the first candle, got that first book published, used that to k take it around and get donations for the second book, and finally three books took him like four or five years in the early 60s. And when he had them, he approached Sumati Maharaji, bless her soul, she gave him a free ticket on, on her uh, uh, bo boat to uh, New York. So, uh, the sacred leisure tre tre treasure left by Vas, he rendered into English for your speculations taints. And this was uh, so much of his preaching, that's why he called it Bhagavad Gita as it is, because as many of you know, Bhagavad Gita had existed in translation since the 19th century. There were there was, uh, these, these uh, Western writers, English writers, known as the Transcendentalists. Emerson was one, Thoreau. They were interested in the Bhagavad Gita. They even quoted, we quoted on the back of the book. Uh, but what could people really gather from translations that were produced by people like that? They didn't have the, the purity and the understanding that comes from being completely in the parampara. So free of speculations taints, Bhagavad Gita as it is, Srimad Bhagavatam as it is, and thus he mercifully fulfilled Sri Saraswati's aim. That uh, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur had told Srila Prabhupada to write, and, and when, he, when he started, uh, he, he wrote that one poem, uh, 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 what is it, Absolute Ascension Thou Hast Proved, uh, Impersonal Calamity Thou Hast Moved or Removed, Prabhupada, and he, he edited that word, by the way, moved to make removed. It's not my, my change. He edited it in one, one uh, version. So anyway, uh, and, and Bhakti Sananda said to one of his uh, other devotees, whatever he, whatever he writes, print it. You know. So he, he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and eventually through his purity he was able to get, uh, help people to help him to publish his books in, in English. And then through English, so many languages, at least 90, 100 languages now, many of his books are appearing all over the world. Then in the, uh, <laughs> the brilliant sun of Lord Govinda's form is shining bright. So this is one of Srila Prabhupada's missions. You find it especially in the books he, he wrote in India, which is the first canto, and you may not know the second canto, he wrote also in India, although he didn't publish it. He brought the manuscript with him, a big pile of, of, of pages that he had typed out yeah. very, very, uh, with great effort. So uh, you find oftentimes in Prabhupada's books that he mentions the impersonalists, the maya bodies, and that uh, right at the, in, the, in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, there's a verse, Natve Vaham Jatu Nasam Natvam Neme Janaripa. Never was it a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any more cease to be. Now, our commentators, and in Srila Prabhupada's purport, very long purport, uh, is, is using this verse as a combat against the Mayavadis. And that's what our Acharyas did. We have all existed eternally as people, as living entities, 
separate, not merged in Krishna. We didn't come into being and then merge back into Krishna. So he, right, right from the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, you read the second chapter and you'll see he's battling with the Mayavadis. And we know, I remember when the seventh chapter of the Adi Lila came out. This was, uh, came out as the Lord Chaitanya in five features. It's all about the Panchatattva, but it's also uh, the, the large section where Lord Chaitanya uh, debates, uh, converts uh, Mahaprakashananda uh, Maha Saraswati and his thousands of followers in Banaras, which is the stronghold of the Mayavadis. And Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati had written extensive commentary, which the Prabhupada translated, refuting the, the uh, impersonalist philosophy. So he... Uh, uh, the brilliant son of Lord Govinda's form. So the whole thing is that, yes, the Absolute has form, qualities, pastimes, activities. He has a place. He's a person. And Srila Prabhupada worked uh, throughout his, uh, his, his uh, preaching uh, uh, efforts in establishing that fact. So that son makes all the Mayavadi glowworms hide in shame. And then, again, describing how the, the Srimad Bhagavatam, he was writing, as very famously, he gave up his sleep. He would get up at 12 in the, at midnight. He had a big burgeoning society he had to manage, and, you know, there was always writing letters. But that time, that's precious time, early, early morning hours, where he was used to, to uh, dictate uh, mostly his uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. And he had his, you know, uh, tra transcribers and translators and editors, you know, produce that. So that is uh, flowing everywhere in this world. Uh, how many th thousands of, of uh, was it 40,000 more? And plus, recently there was a, a Bhadra Punima. It's a, it's a very auspicious day to give Bhagavatam. So Vaisheshika Prabhu and many others mounted an effort to sell tens of thousands, 43,000 43, sets, and plus sets of Bhagavatam worldwide, which is which is amazing. So it's, it's actually flowing. The, the pure Gandhi of the Bhagavatam is flowing throughout the world because of his great effort. And there's, there's the, uh, you know, so much beautiful, wonderful verses. The prayers are there and the pastimes of Krishna that everyone can, can understand in, given by a pure devotee. That's the whole thing. And then, uh, so then just again about the books. Kali, we know, is so powerful. And it's such a negative force, the Kali Yuga, and, and we, we, there's a per person behind it, per Kali personified. So he has a formidable army, all of the, you know, the, uh, the, the four sins, the pillars of the four sins, they're so rampant. So, but they're being slain by the arrows of, the, of his books. The books are counteracting, countervailing force, pushing back on the influence of Kali Yuga. And then, and then he, he talks about how the, the Hare Krishna movement is a desire tree whose fruits are the splendid ways Lord Gora's army wins recruits. So the main, main way, of course, is Harinam Sankirtan, book distribution, all of the, the, the temples and outposts and, and programs that are going on to give people a chance to associate with devotees, hear the pure instructions of the pure devotee, and of course participate in Harinam uh, Kirtan and take uh, Bhagavad Prasadam. It's, it's, it's just a this expansion of Srila Prabhupada's program and Lord Chaitanya's program. So this is planted on the earth and the fruits are growing and it's, it's uh, expanding throughout the earth. And finally, you just say how, you know, Srila Prabhupada is such an ocean of compassion. The efforts that he, that he underwent, uh, risking his life, in ill health, traveling, you know, all for us, for the conditioned souls, so we can get a chance to get the pure message of Lord Chaitanya, the holy name, the instructions, and the facility to, to, to uh, do something about it. Come to a temple, come to a center, and associate with devotees. So he's an ocean of compassion, and he's taken, of course, a pure devotee. He's uh, with, uh, with Lord uh, Krishna in the spiritual world, and uh, we can join him there if we follow his words, as was pointed out this morning, and I'm sure will be pointed again, that we can all associate with Srila Prabhupada in the most important way, through his words and his instructions. And the more that we hear them and follow them, the more we'll feel Srila Prabhupada's presence guiding us in our efforts to advance in devotional service. So that's my little homage to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for listening, and I hope it was uh, okay. All well, glories to Srila Prabhupada. And now, Maharaj, would you like to give us some? Thank you. Thank you.
We're not offering our obeisances first because of the time factor and all of that. I'm fine well, with us being yeah, efficient. Yeah, I, I did that. No, no, I'm fine with us being efficient. Okay. That way more people get to speak about Prabhupada. I wanted to say something first, and then I'm going to read something. But the, um, if we want to know Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of course, his Prabhupada's teachings of Lord Chaitanya, but what is the book that, well, here's a big hint. What are the books that it's recommended we read. What do we read if we want to know the deepest understanding of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Somebody mumbled something other than Dravida. It's always Dravida. You gotta give other people a chance. Chaitanya Charitamrita, exactly. Now, who is Chaitanya Charitamrita written by? Krishnadas Kaviraj. Now, was Krishnadas Kaviraj a direct associate of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Anybody know? No. He was a disciple of Raghunath Das Goswami. And yet, for the deepest understanding of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we don't go to a direct disciple. I mean, we can also, there's many other revelations in so many other ways, and Rupa Goswami, Sanatana, and all the Goswamis. But the standard Gaudiya Vaishnava, we go to Chaitanya Charitamrita, written by a grand disciple. Now, don't worry. You don't have to report me to the GBC. I haven't gone Ritvik. Don't worry. Just like I'm going to read something but in order for me to read it, I need my glasses. Now, the experience of me and the paper is direct. It's a direct experience. But it's impossible without the medium of the glasses. In the same way, there's no question of, you know, Ritvik, you approach Prabhupada directly, and, you know, because he came to you in a dream, and it doesn't work that way. You have to go through a living spiritual master coming in the Sampradaya. So we're not discounting that. But given one follows that process, guru disciple, guru disciple, living spiritual master, taking initiation, if one goes through that process, there's absolutely nothing that restricts one from having the deepest realization, understanding, and relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Because people say, oh, I missed the boat, I'm a grand disciple, you're so fortunate. I, I won't discount the good fortune of being able to meet Prabhupada personally, but we all know there's Vani and Vapu. And one other thing, now what was I going to say? Um, oh, Prabhupada said, the first big Christmas marathon in America, and I think it's 73, I forget what year it was, maybe 74, um, it's when we had the first concentrated effort organized by Rameshwar. And it went, you know, all the temples were across America and Canada, across the different time zones, were reporting their scores to Rameshwar. And ultimately Rameshwar took them, compiled them all and took them up to Srila Prabhupada. And it was just something amazing, you know, it was like, and they came in, you know, when it's nine o'clock, they, everyone was supposed to stop at 9, of course everybody stopped at 10, you know, because they all wanted to do something nice. But when it rolled across America and Ramaswar compiled all those scores, and Prabhupada, by the time he had them all, it was like about 10 o'clock uh, California time, West Coast time, and he went up to Prabhupada's room in Los Angeles and began, Prabhupada was in his bed already, getting ready to go to bed. And uh, Prabhupada began, he told me personally, Ramaswar, Prabhupada began rolling in ecstasy, just hearing the scores. And the next day, Prabhupada wrote a letter. And the point I wanted to make from that letter, Prabhupada says, I am taking you all as servants, representatives of my spiritual master, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who've come to help me with this mission. And then Prabhupada writes, you can be certain that he is pouring his blessings down upon you. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, 
via Srila Prabhupada, is pouring his blessings down on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's grand disciples. Prabhupada says the grandfather is always more merciful than the father. So it's not, Prabhupada is open to all, everyone, just as we can pray to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we can pray to Krishna, we can pray to Srimati Radharani, we can pray to the six Goswamis. These are not limited personalities via the medium of our spiritual master. So I just wanted to, Prabhupada's for everyone, for all time. And what I wanted to read, this is something I read when I was coming to the temple. Um, first Canto Bhagavatam, one of those brown brick Bhagavatams, the Delhi Bhagavatams. And, uh, well, I don't want to say much about me, but how Prabhupada so poignantly, so movingly, so convincingly touches the essence of the human condition. Prabhupada actually speaks to our heart. And the big question, you know, if there's God, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do devotees have, why do devotees suffer? Why are there setbacks? Where's the merciful Lord? You know, Scientology, if I'm an expert in Scientology, I just go into my meditation and I'll be able to get a parking spot when I go to the shopping center. That's considered, you know, well, where's God, you know? He's my order supplier. So I just wanted to read Prabhupada's, because we're all suffering. Anybody who's not suffering, what they say, if you're not paranoid, you're not paying attention. Uh, you know, any conscious being, this is, a, this is a rough place. So why, if there's God, what's the reason for the whole thing? It's the, it's the existential question. So I just wanted to read this and I'll be done. And this is Prabhupada. Uh, this is from the first canto Bhagavatam. This is when um, uh, Narada Muni is speaking to Vyasadeva and, you know, bringing his, Vyasadeva is feeling despondent. But he, here's the story. Narada is describing his own life. So this starts with the first canto, chapter 6, text 22. And it's not long. I just have a few verses and purport. Srila Prabhupada said, i oh, sorry, Srila Vyasadeva said, why... What did you, Narada, do after the departure of the great sages who'd instructed you in the science, scientific transcendental knowledge before beginning of your present birth? Next verse. O son of Burma, how did you pass your life after initiation? How did you attain this body, having quit your old one in due course? Prophet says in the purport. Srila Narada Muni in his previous life was just an ordinary maidservant's son. So how he became so perfectly transformed into the spiritual body of eternal life, bliss, and knowledge is certainly important. Srila Vyasadeva decided, uh, desired him, meaning Narada, to disclose the fact for everyone's satisfaction. Next verse. Sri Narada said, The great sages who had imparted scientific knowledge of transcendence to me departed for other places, and I had to pass my life in this way. Purport. Previous life... Narada Muni was impregnated with spiritual knowledge by the grace of the great sages. There was a tangible change in his life, although he was only a boy of five years. That is an important symptom visible after initiation by the bona fide spiritual master. Actual association of devotees brings about a quick change in the life for spiritual realization. How it, is so, how it so acted upon the previous life of Narada Muni is described by and by in this chapter. Next verse. I was the only son of my mother, who was not only a simple woman, but a maidservant as well. Since I was her only offspring, she had no other alternative for protection. She bound me with the tie of affection. Next verse. She wanted to look after my maintenance properly, but because she was not independent, she was not able to do anything for me. This world is full, fully under the control of the Supreme Lord. Therefore, everyone is like a wooden doll in the hands of a puppet master. Next verse. When I was a mere child of five, I lived in a Brahmana school. I was dependent on my mother's affection and had no other experience of other lands. Next verse. Once upon a time, my poor mother, when going out one night to milk a cow, was bitten on the leg by a serpent influenced by supreme time purport. And here's the point Prabhupada begins to make. 
That is the way of dragging a sincere soul back to God. The poor boy was being looked after only after his affectionate mother, and yet the mother was taken from this world by the supreme will in order to put him completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord. So probably beginning to explain what's actually, tra what's the hand behind suffering in the lives of devotees? Why? What's actually going on here? I took this, this is how Narada Muni responded, I took this as a special mercy of the Lord who always desires benedictions for his devotee. And so thinking, I started for the north. What? His mother's died? He's five years old and he's thinking, oh, this is the hand of Krishna. There must be a benediction behind this. This is how a devotee thinks. And, we'll see. and, because, and we know the fruit of the thing that he became Narada Muni. It worked. Purport. Confidential devotees of the Lord see every step, see in every step a benedictory direction of the Lord. What is considered to be odd or difficult moment in the mundane sense is accepted as the special mercy of the Lord. Mundane prosperity is a kind of material fever, and by the grace of the Lord, the temperature of this material fever is gradually diminished, and spiritual health is obtained step by step. Mundane people cannot understand it. And then I wanted to read one other purport that sums it together. This is from the 10th canto, actually. A sincere devotee earnestly desires to go back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, he willingly accepts the Lord's merciful punishment and continues offering respects and obeisances to the Lord with his heart, words, and body. Such a bona fide servant of the Lord, considering all hardship, a small price to pay for gaining the personal association of the Lord, certainly becomes the legitimate son of God, as indicated here by the word diabak. Just as one cannot approach the sun without becoming fire, one cannot approach the supreme, supreme pure Lord Krishna without undergoing a rigid purificatory process, which may appear like suffering, but which is in fact, here's the great line, a curative treatment administered by the personal hand of the Lord. I'm going to read that again. Um, one can, you can't approach Krishna unless you're purified. So how do we, what is going on there? It's purification. That's what's actually happening. And Prabhupada says, um, which may appear like suffering, but which is in fact a curative treatment administered by the personal hand of the Lord. So just here Prabhupada explains the whole nature of suffering, what is the purpose of it, how a devotee sees it, how we actually can take what is uh, overwhelms people, how we can actually take that and it's a tool for going back to Godhead and how we can understand Krishna's you know, hand in this world. It's just profound. And it's just in a few paragraphs. And it go, not only does it go beyond, but it completely explains what any other philosopher, any other religious tradition has to say. So it's a sample of what Prabhupada's given us. Hare Krishna. You're the master of ceremonies. What happens next? So, that was very nice. Thank His Holiness. Oh, I'm sorry. Bhadrina Ryan Swami. <laughs> very much. And now I'd like to call on Mother Kanchanbala, our senior most devotee. Thank you. Hare Krishna. To my beloved spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, please accept my most humble obeisances at the dust of your transcendental lotus feet. I know I am so unqualified, but nonetheless, you unreservedly and with unlimited kindness allow me to be engaged in your loving service. And I know I am not advanced and and appreciating with all many of your devotees who are so dedicated and devoted. I am humbled how you, my dear spiritual master and spiritual father, personally, personally encouraged me amongst many other devotees. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya 4, Chapter 11, Text 233, Srila Prabhupada translate, 
translates, quote, in his own pastimes in Vrindavan, when Krishna used to eat on the bank of the Jamuna and sit in the center of his friends, every one of the cowherd boys would perceive that Krishna was looking at him. In the same way, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was dancing, everyone saw that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was facing him, unquote. And that is just how it was, as I remember so crystal clear, when Srila Prabhupada looked in your direction with a crowd of devotees, every single one felt Srila Prabhupada was directly seeing them. And that was so true. Krishna mercifully let me have some interactions with his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, and these memories I really cherish. One time in 1968, I went with the devotees from New York to Montreal Temple. I don't recall how we all traveled to get up there. The Montreal Temple before was a large bowling alley. We thought it was such a big temple as all we had ever seen were small storefronts. Srila Prabhupada stayed in an apartment a few blocks away. At this point, the clamps were tightened as the consciousness had evolved to protect Srila Prabhupada's precious health and valuable time, so no one knew where he was staying. All of a sudden, a devotee went up to me. He asked, can you bring this bag of boga over to where Srila Prabhupada was staying and for his servant, Himavati Prabhu, to prepare for him? I was more than happy to do this service. When I got to the door, it was completely quiet. And not to disturb Srila Prabhupada, I knocked very softly. Himavati came to the door, opening it a tiny crack. As I handed her the bag of groceries at the corner of my eye, I saw radiant flowing saffron robes of Srila Prabhupada as he was sitting chanting Japa. Srila Prabhupada asked, who is at the door? She said, Kanchambala has come to bring boga. Then Srila Prabhupada said, tell her to come in. It was so beyond my expectations. I was so happy as I fell to the floor offering my obeisances. Srila Prabhupada pointed for me to sit down. I sat down. Then Srila Prabhupada let an insignificant fledging disciple, a mere teenager, chant Japa with him. At one point, my mind was reeling. What can I ask Srila Prabhupada? As I knew many of my god brothers and god sisters freely asked questions. I had always felt shy and didn't want to waste Prabhupada's time. Srila Prabhupada was about to leave that morning to the airport. He then asked me, what is the weather like? I answered, very cold, Srila Prabhupada, as it was a dismal great November day. Shortly after, the temple presidents came in and sat down in front of me. Himavati came out with cut up fruit and cookies. Srila Prabhupada partook of it and then passed out individually to all those present. I was hesitant to lean over everyone to receive the Maha Maha Prasadam, and Srila Prabhupada looked at me directly. His lotus eyes beckoned me to take, and I joyfully took. This happened two more times around, and I thereafter unreservedly reached forward, honoring Srila Prabhupada's sacred Maha Maha Prasadam. Srila Prabhupada always displayed such causeless mercy to all. One time, Srila Prabhupada was initiating one person with a background of stealing. A devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, he is a thief. Srila Prabhupada immediately said, quiet, I know what I am doing. Even though 45 years ago, Srila Prabhupada left this world, he is still forever present through loving devotional service and following his teachings. How Srila Prabhupada impressed, inspired, and moved so many others who came in contact with him. 
From my mother meeting with Srila Prabhupada, she didn't understand a word he was saying, yet expressed he was a very wise person, fulfilling a fatherly image for me. To a journalist being so impressed with Srila Prabhupada's purity, honesty, and knowledge amongst the bewildered, spaced out hippies, to what I read in Giraj Maharaj's book about his uncle, who was awestruck with Srila Prabhupada's exalted self. All this is always so blissful, uplifting to hear. This material world is such a rocky, tumultuous place, with inevitably no good end in sight. But clasping, clinging on to your divine lotus feet is my only hope. It is by serving you, who are Krishna's dear most devotee, along with wanting, maintaining the consciousness of being servant of the servant of the servant, which is very pleasing to you. I beg to remain always your spiritual daughter and disciple, Kanchambala Dasi. I'm sorry? How do you follow that? How do you, How do you follow that? Oh, yeah. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Is this, is this online? Is this online? I assume so, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. My name is Prabhupada Das. Dear Srila Prabhupada, please accept my obeisances. All glories to your divine grace. In my own Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharni Nivasesa Srinivari Pashatali Satarni on this auspicious day, I wish to give my appreciation to you. As you have said, the Appearance Day and Disappearance Day are actually the same thing. One moment you are here, and then the next moment you appear somewhere else. Your existence is not ended with the disappearance of your body, even though it is fully spiritual. It is this basic spiritual truth that sustains all of your followers and disciples in your apparent absence. You have not actually left us. But you are fully present when someone reads your books, or when we are associating with other devotees. Still, we are sad when that final, inevitable day arrives. Serving you in separation is another way of associating with you, perhaps even more intense than what we feel when you were physically present. You have said that personal association is less important than association through your teachings, especially following, following your instructions. I often feel your presence and realize that you are always with me, even if I am not aware of it. Sadly, I don't always follow your direction and forget that you are within my heart along with the super soul. Over the last week, we've been hearing from older God brothers reminiscing of the times who were with us, how we felt and how much inspiration we got. The excitement and enthusiasm we had was more than wonderful. I personally was very fortunate to have been in your presence many times. I got to see how you interacted with the devotees and guests, dignitaries, and ordinary people. I witnessed your humble demeanor and innocence firsthand. And yet I saw the most powerful personality I have ever seen in my whole life. A simple gesture, a lift of an eyebrow, a flip of your head would speak volumes and command respect. You never asked us to do something that you wouldn't do. But you appreciated our feeble attempts to serve you in your mission, even if we made mistakes. If we were able to take chastisement, you mercifully gave it for our benefit, just like a concerned father would correct his children. In every circumstance, you were a perfect judge of character and had the most intimate understanding of what to do or say to obtain the best outcome. You were tolerant of us to an extreme extent, having come from low families and bad association. How it was possible to command an army of us Malechas and Yavanas is a miracle in itself, like the monkeys and bears that assisted Lord Ramachandra in finding Sita. It could never be said that you came, for, came here for comfort in a peaceful life. 
As if this were not enough, you had your most important service of translating the sacred text of the Vedas, which you managed to do while we slept, allowing yourself only a few hours of sleep. All of this stress must certainly have shortened your life, yet you didn't seem to care. If there was an engagement somewhere at the end of the day, unexpectedly, you didn't hesitate to go. All for the sake of saving the conditioned souls. It seems you never tired of spending every moment in some sort of preaching. The sheer volume of your writing, carefully choosing every word, spending so much time in glorification of Lord Krishna could only have happened because you are not a conditioned soul like us. You are fully immersed in samadhi, experiencing your loving relationship with the Lord, but at the same time, showing example of how to be a devotee in this world. You were not impersonal or unconcerned about us on our level. You built temples in India specifically for Westerners, equipped with amenities that Westerners are familiar with. You knew the mentality and were prepared to do whatever was necessary to make us comfortable. The many aspects of simple life were not forced upon us, but taught to us in ways that made sense. We learned to brush our teeth with neem twigs or eucalyptus, but were not, did not require it. Visiting the Holy Doms, we were not advised to go barefoot. Austerities were minimized, so our minds were not disturbed too much. Your main thrust was to fan our little spark into full Krishna consciousness. At the same time, he would speak strongly against the demonic society we grew up in, pointing out the fallacies in modern thought. It helped us to distance ourselves from where we had just, from where we had just come. Alas, sometimes this would test our faith when you poked holes in our quote-unquote scientific understanding of our world and gave your opinion that the astronauts never went to the moon. It is, of course, understood that the opinion of the guru is much heavier than anyone else's. What to speak of one who has accepted initiation from him? You were never fooled by anyone. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada, for all that you have given us, your disciples and the world. It is difficult to have a full understanding of how much you actually did and how it will save humanity into the future. We somehow think that we need to, quote unquote, fill your shoes when actually they are still filled. We don't need to try to imitate your mannerisms or demeanor to become, sing, to become something more than we actually are. Though you asked us all to become gurus, our immature nature impels us to be, try to somehow become special, worthy of worship or recognition. Actually, ironically, this is actually a disqualification and a subtle enticement to bolster our false ego. The only qualification is to speak only what we have learned sincerely. And if there's something wonderful in us, Krishna will inspire others to recognize it. Aspiration is a dangerous thing. But you had none of this. You patiently stood in line for a shower like the rest of us, not demanding that you be offered a higher position. Later, we regretted our mistake but appreciated how humble you were and how tolerant you were. You thus earned every bit of respect without demanding it. The real truth is, even if we spent lifetimes recognizing your, your exalted position as founder Acharya, we would never find the end. As Lord Krishna and Lord Chaitanya, Chaitanya had pastimes going on simultaneously at every moment, you also manifested wonderful pastimes in the same way. Your servants like Sruti Kirti, Kirti can attest to even the smallest details. It was wonderful, even intoxicating, to be there while you spoke. In, Indian, in intimate settings, I saw you warming up your host and his family in a lunch engagement. On stages in many Indian cities, I uh, saw and heard you speak like fire and brimstone to audiences who lapped up every word, recognizing the exalted nature of yourself and what you had accomplished. I heard lectures in Vrindavan and Mayapur, Los Angeles, London, Bombay, and many other places, as well as morning walks in Los Angeles, Bombay, and England. It was a privilege and special mercy for a, hope, for a hopelessly lost soul as myself. And that anyone can take advantage in the present day to hear recordings and videos of those same lectures and intimate room conversations. Though I lament I could not do very much personally to assist your divine grace, all I can say is that I was there to witness what I saw and what I was able to realize. I beg your pardon for my incessant offenses and foolishness. I hope that I can become a better servant and example for others, and thus win your favor. If I could just get a little smile, 
it would be my perfection. But if I need chastisement, that would be mercy too. I certainly know which one I deserve. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada, for all you have done. Throughout eternity, I am indebted to you, your father and servant, Palmana Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Palamano. That was very moving. So now, by Kunta Babu. Uh, okay, well, it's just up to you if you want to. Yeah, share what you have. It doesn't have to be long. Jai Shri Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Yeah, actually, when Pavamana was reading, I was just remembering uh, reading a Chutananda Prabhu's book, and uh, he was in India, right, when, and Srila Prabhupada came, uh, early 70s, and then he and Prabhupada started reminiscing about 26 Second Avenue, and actually it, it came out that they were all using Prabhupada's bathroom, you know, because the storefront, all these new devotees were staying in the storefront, and, and the only bathroom was in Prabhupada's apartment, and they were all showering there, and actually there was only one towel, and Pra Prabhupada was sharing his towel with like, you know, seven or eight people, you know, and Achyutananda and Srila Prabhupada were, you know, laughing and reminiscing about this, and Achyutananda shares that in his book, that Blazing Sadhus, I remember reading that, I, th I think Pabhamana Prabhu referenced that, it was, yeah, so I, I'm sorry I didn't write anything, um, my personal observation of Srila Prabhupada was just very slight, just over the course of five days in 1975, but uh, I could just try to share a couple of memories. Uh, the last night that he was in Philadelphia, um, <clears throat> every night he would hold an evening darshan. His quarters were across the street and about two doors down from the temple. It had been the Grihasta building, but they all moved out for Srila Prabhupada, and everything got cleaned and painted, and it was quite nice, you know, other than the usual smell of fresh paint you always hear about. But anyway, so uh, Prabhupada's room was pretty small, and the last night that he was there, it was the brahmacharis' night to go for darshan, and I actually wasn't a full-time devotee, but I was staying with the brahmacharis pretty regularly, so they allowed me to tag along. And uh, so we were coming up the stairs, you know, the old East Coast house, you know, and Brahmananda Swami was at the top of the stairs, you know, pretty imposing, you know, Prabhu, wonderful devotee, but big, you know, and strong. and. Uh, you know, anyway, I remember thinking, I wonder if I still had hair and everything, if I would get 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 in, you know. But we came in and uh, sat down, and it was a small, it was like an East Coast, you know, bedroom in an old Victorian era house, so not maybe 150 square feet, nothing bigger. And I was sitting about as far as you could get, you know, which was about probably seven or eight feet from where Prabhupada was sitting <laughs> across the room. And Ravindra Sarup was the temple president, and he was working on his PhD uh, for quite a few years, a very brilliant devotee. So he was friends with all of the, you know, other professors and whatnot. <clears throat> so he had brought that night, the, you know, each night there would be kind of a chief guest or whatever. So that night it was a professor from the university where he, he was working on his PhD philosophy. And so it was an Indian, you know, gentleman, and he had come with a few students. and. Uh, so Srila Prabhupada was like sitting in the middle and uh, to Srila Prabhupada's left was Swarup Damodar Prabhu who became Bhakti Srup Damodar Maharaj to his right was Rabindra Sarup, the temple president. The usual Prabhupada had like that low desk, you know, and he was sitting behind it. So the professor was introduced. He's a professor of, of Hinduism. And Srila Prabhupada then asked him, you know, what is Hinduism, you know? and. The professor said, uh, I do not know, Swamiji, you know, <laughs> for that I have come to you. So then Srila Prabhupada turned to Swarup Damodar, who's at that time, I don't know, he's, I think he had his, just gotten his PhD, or he was, you know, very high in the academic learning anyway. I, I think he was a PhD by then. This was 1975. So he said, he's a teacher, and he says he doesn't know what he's teaching. What do you think about that? And Swarup Damodar said, Prabhupada, he is teaching, and he does not know. He's a cheater. So then Prabhupada turned back to the professor and says, he says, you're a cheater, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's how the conversation began. And then the professor said, you know, I, I, I have come to you. And then Prabhupada said, well, if you come to me, then, you know, you, you, like these, you have to surrender. And then the professor, what is the etymological meaning of the word surrender? You know, so anyway, it, it got off, you know, kind of a, 
and Shida Prabhupada must have sensed this guy was, you know, kind of a, a, a rascal. So it, anyway, my memory is not so sharp, but it very quickly escalated, and it escalated, and it got to the point where Shida Prabhupada was banging his fist on this low desk, and this professor was also banging his. I mean, it really escalated, and like, you know, I was 18, and uh, I got mugged once. Uh, huh? Ah. You're, Krishna, you're Krishna, you know, uh, you're a Krishna Bhakta, but you're Krishna's uh, 1,108 wives, and you're just mundane and lusty. Yeah, so it, it, got, it got really heated. And anyway, so, you know, I had seen violence before, I had seen anger, but like Prabhupada, it was like there were lightning bolts, like when Lord Nishingadev came out of the pillar. I mean, that was how it felt, you know, like, like I... I don't even think I was breathing, and I don't think anybody else was either. It was like Prabhupada was manifesting this divine anger, you know, very intense. And then right at the crescendo of it all, Brahmananda kind of like, you know, he ambles over and puts his hand on Dr. Patel's shoulder and very gently lifts him up and says, you know, I think it's time for you to leave, doctor, you know, <laughs> and walks him across the room and down the staircase and his students follow him, you know. So it was a very intense experience. I mean, it was like all this happened in about five minutes, you know. And then Srila Prabhupada turns to Rabindra and says, why did, you, why did you bring that man, you know? And Rabindra was like, you know, like they say, a lighter shade of pale. And, and everybody else, that was pretty much it. I mean, that was so intense. That was a darshan. And we all just offered obeisances. And, you know, within a minute, we were all d down the stairs. So years later, I actually read uh, Rabindra Srila Prabhu had written a little essay, and he, he mentioned this experience. And at least in his essay, he said that, this is kind of the follow-up, that it has to do with how the pure devotee utilizes these things but is not polluted by them. Like lust, anger, and greed are dangerous, right? So it was kind of amazing for me as like a hippie kid to see Prabhupada such a sadhu, but so, you know, seemingly angry. So then he, he wrote this essay, and he said in there that all night he was rehearsing his apologies, and then he went to Prabhupada very early, like before Mangal Arti, to apologize, and Prabhupada was just like a lotus, he oh, I think nothing of it, you know, and then he realized Prabhupada just had to chastise this person, you know, but he was utilizing anger in Krishna's service, but he was not at all, like we, like if we, if I ever got that angry, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know what would happen, it would take weeks to wear off, you know. So anyway, that was one memory just thought I'd share. So, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, Paneshri, you have something? something yeah, but please, yeah, just quickly, because Rabindra, it's a great narration by Vaikuntha Prabhu. Rabindra told me that the next morning, um, after apologizing and all of that, the devotees were sitting around, and they say, what will happen to this man? You know, to become so angry to a pure devotee and shouting, like like Fike was saying, pounding his desk and shouting. And, uh, you know, the devotees were offering their different opinions. Well, he'll be like Ashwatthama, he'll have to wander in the Himalayas with no shelter. He'll be born in Calcutta with no arms and no legs, playing a harmonica. They, you know, they were, oh, what will happen to this guy, you know? And everybody, you don't have to drink boiling ghee. I mean, whatever. I don't know if they were, nobody said that, but they were offering their different horrendous results of this. And so everybody offered their opinion. There were about eight devotees. And it came around to Prabhupada. What was his opinion? Hmm. Prabhupada said, we could forgive him. Wow. Nobody had thought of that. Nobody, you know, but Prabhupada, you know, he's a fool, you know. And Prabhupada dealt with him properly, put him in his place, but we could forgive him, you know. Hare Krishna, gracious Srila Prabhupada. I just wanted to add one thing along with that is, um, my, um, as many of you know, my father had met Srila Prabhupada also. And their conversations were also very heated, from my understanding. So, <laughs> so um, he was forgiven, obviously, because I'm here. So <laughs> that's what I'd like to add. Um, Okay. <laughs> um, I actually just wanted to read this, and I think it kind of is really interesting that it came today with what everybody's been saying. And it's dated May 6, 1977, and it's a letter by Srila Prabhupada. And it says, My dear beloved disciples, please accept my blessings. I know that over the past years you have suffered so many tribulations to push forward Krishna consciousness in Germany. But this has not stopped you from your determination to serve the cause of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
A devotee is pleased when there is difficulty, for in these difficulties he is forced to remember Krishna. We cannot expect that the people of Kali Yuga will welcome our attempt to spread Krishna consciousness. It is just like a lunatic asylum. The patients are running around madly, and when the doctor tries to give them treatments, they insist that they are not crazy. Sometimes the patient even strikes the doctor. So our task is like that. We cannot stand to see people suffering due to ignorance. What is that ignorance? They do not know that they are not their body. This Krishna consciousness movement is meant to deliver people to the proper understanding that they are not their body, that they are pure spirit soul. We may or may not be appreciated. That is not our concern. We must execute the order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is Yare Deka Tare Kaha Krishna Upadesha Armara Agnya Guru Haya Tare E Desha Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila 7, 128 Whomever you meet, instruct them to follow the orders of Sri Krishna as they are given in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. Jai Radha Giri Dhari Ki Jai Jai Jagannath Baldev Subhadrani Ki Jai Jai Gauranga Kajai Nichanandam Whomever you meet, instruct them to follow the orders of Sri Krishna as they are given in the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. In this way, by my order, become a spiritual master and try to liberate everyone in this land. Unquote. So our business is to satisfy the Acharyas and Krishna. If they are pleased, then we know that our work is successful. Go on spreading the Sankirtana movement more and more. I am only one person. Because all of you have kindly cooperated with me, this movement has now become a success all over the world. Be assured that there is no more direct way to preach than to distribute Krishna conscious books. Whoever gets a book is benefited. If he reads the book, he is benefited still more. Or if he gives the book to someone else for reading, both he and the other person is benefited. Even if one does not read the book, but simply holds it and sees it, he is benefited. If he sim simply gives small donation towards the work of Krishna consciousness, he is benefited. And anyone who distributes these transcendental literatures, he is also benefited. Therefore, Sankirtana is the prime benediction for this age. Krishna Varnam Tvisak Krishnam Sangopanga Varshatam Yajnai Sankirtana Praya Yajanti Su Medesaha Srimad Bhagavatam 11.5.32 Hoping this meets you all well, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So I was thinking that everybody, what everybody shared, it's almost like Sri Srila Prabhupada responded. To me, that's what it felt like. And I was thinking that he has such, you know, he is thanking us, you know, and it reminds me of in Chaitanya Charitamrita, where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I'm only one garden, there's so many fruit to, sh to, dig to distribute that I need all you to help me. So in the same way, Srila Prabhupada is asking us to do that. So. Thank you, and all glory to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Vanesha. Guru Krishna Prabhu, do you have something? Time is there? So there's something from Sajit Maharaj that I also wanted to read. Srila Prabhupada, please sit my humble obeisances. I wanted to share my realizations with you today, Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> when, I, when I first came, Srila Prabhupada, I, I, I did not know you. I knew prasadam, the devotees, the philosophy, delicious prasadam, sweet devotees, and the highest knowledge on the planet. I was focused on the gift that I was having 
but not the gift giver, you Srila Prabhupada. My appreciation grew and I began to understand my position as a lost and condemned spirit soul far away from the mercy of the Vaishnavas of Vrindavan, drowning far out to sea with no chance for rescue. Some people are drowning uh, near to the shore uh, and some are drowning far out to sea and all are feeling supremely grateful to be saved. But those who are lost deep out to the sea are the most appreciative as we could see no one to save us in sight, only hopelessness in all directions. You came against all odds. No one had their money on you. No one had faith just praying that you would come back to India alive. After I had become familiar with the different tastes of prasadam and Krishna with his threefold bending form, playing the flute and wearing peacock feather, I was wondering what I would discover next. And that was you, Srila Prabhupada. The shock of your <coughs> struggles on the ocean voyage, living with the meat eater and the Mayavadi guru, struggling to make ends meet with no support initially, was horrifying and heartbreaking to hear. I felt an overwhelming sense of debt to you, Srila Prabhupada, and, <coughs> and somehow, um, I have done a little something in service to your ISKCON. I am now coming closer to my death at age 66, and now I am in a bit of a panic as I, I actually come to understand that I, I haven't even begun to repay you, and it's so embarrassing. I'm thinking about my time of death more and more, and faced with the thought of my bankrupt condition. Somehow, with the few remaining years I have left, I hope that with Krishna's mercy, I can close out my account and you will be pleased. Today here in San Diego, we have gathered to remember your sacrifice, your heroic victories all over the world and your glorious passing. Please continue to empower me in this final chapter of my life in your service. Forever grateful in your service. Guru Krishna Das. So I um, also wanted to read this uh, by uh, His Holiness Satchip Das Goswami. Um, this is an excerpt of uh, one of his writings, Prabhupada Meditations, Volume 3. Um, let's see. When did he post this? Well, he posted this nine hours ago, but um, it's a free writing journal. It was sometime after um, Prabhupada's disappearance. <clears throat> so this is from his, his book. Our meditation on Prabhupada should be pleasing to him. When Lord Brahma praised Lord Krishna, he remained silent and grave. It appeared that the Supreme Lord was not much impressed by Brahma's speech. Nevertheless, Brahma's words on that occasion are glorious, as preserved in the 10th canto, 14th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam. Our own homages to our spiritual master cannot be as eloquent as those spoken by Lord Brahma. But how will we know if Prabhupada and Lord Krishna are pleased with our words? One criteria is that we cooperate with the society of devotees, if we make disturbance among the, his devotees, then our praises of Srila Prabhupada become a travesty. Lord Krishna is not alone. He is always with his devotees. Similarly, Prabhupada's followers are part of his eternal entourage. Too much criticism of his followers is a type of criticism against Prabhupada. We may think that we have built an indomitable fortress around Prabhupada in our minds we can defend him from all critics. Nevertheless, if we allow ourselves free shot pot, uh, pot shots at his disciples, then we are not protecting Prabhupada. 
protecting the disciples of Prabhupada does not mean blindly accepting whatever they do. We are sometimes compelled by conscience to say that some devotees are not following Prabhupada. This, though, is a difficult area to enter. We may easily fall into aparad. The best thing is to set a good example among our devotee friends and try to honor all devotees. Vishwanath Chakravarti has stated that we should offer respect by words and etiquette to all persons who acknowledge Krishna as the Supreme and who are part of the Vaishnav movement. If we think that certain devotees are not fit to associate, then we are not compelled to associate with them intimately. We can select like-minded friends, but we should be respectful toward all. When we combine respect for Prabhupada with respect for his disciples, then we have the perfect union. We may do this, uh, one way uh, to do this is to recall Prabhupada in his pastimes with his disciples. Lord Chaitanya's pastimes are not only about himself, but also about his disciples and relationships among them. Thank you, Guru Krishna Guru. Very nice. Thank you. So now I'm going to ask for uh, people to raise their hands if they have something they want to offer to Srila Prabhupada. It doesn't have to be long, just from the heart. All right, we'll begin. I'm going to call on uh, Guru Dhan Prabhu because he's got something. He's so shy. Hare Krishna, everyone. Every time we um, Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pushtaya, um, sorry, I'm nervous. Um, so every time we uh, we make offerings to Srila Prabhupada, I think you guys all know that I'm a crybaby. And uh, Suresh War here, he pointed that out. But um, I wanted to say a few things. So they say that popularity is tested under one's absence. So if someone's not here, you can see a difference or a change in the mood. Just like in you know, a lot of devotees, um, when they left their body, we saw a big difference in the atmosphere, how the devotees reacted. So you can imagine how the devotees felt when Srila Prabhupada left the planet. And so, I don't know if my services has uh, pleased Srila Prabhupada. I don't know if Srila Prabhupada is pleased with my advancement in Krishna consciousness. I don't know if I'm at all any use to the devotees here. But I do like to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books. So I'll tell a few Sankirtan stories. I used to bring um, the small Prabhupada Lila Rita, the messenger of the Supreme Lord. No. Hmm? Yeah, Prabhupada, I'm sorry, Prabhupada. And I was at La Jolla Cove and I stopped one person, and they weren't interested in any of the books like Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. And when she pointed to the Prabhupada book, she said, what's this? So I had explained to her that this is a biography of a very saintly person. And she said, can you tell me more about him? So I, I said, sure. So I said that he came to the West at the advanced age of 69. He suffered two heart attacks. He came on a cargo boat. You know, he he didn't have anything with him except just some books, some a few dollars in his pocket, um, things like that. So she she asked me what was the purpose. So I told her that he gave us what we forgotten, and she said, "What's that?" So I told her, we forgot who we are, we forgot what the purpose of life is, and I told her that we're suffering life after life. And I said a few other things, and she started crying. 
And so I, I asked her, you know, are you okay? And she said, you know, I can tell that this person was a very saintly person. So just by hearing about Srila Prabhupada, people can understand who he is. And um, I was also distributing books at Balboa Park. And someone pointed at Srila Prabhupada and they said, I met him before. And I said, how did you meet him? And said, a long time ago in the 70s. And then I said, do you know about our philosophy? And she said, no, but all I know is the prasadam. <laughs> so I said, okay. So many people, they know who Srila Prabhupada is by his books, by the, his movement, by his devotees, and some through his uh, prasadam distribution. And so I just wanted to uh, say thank you, Srila Prabhupada, for sending all your kind devotees um, to pick me up from this ocean of birth and death, this life of illusion that I was living before I came to Krishna consciousness. And I could never repay you. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much, Govardhan Prabhu. Yeah, sure. Just because for those who are, anyway, I'll just say it. Primarily, Vijay, Dimitri, and Govardhan go out practically every day out to Balboa Park, sometimes La Jolla Cove. And Prabhupada walked in La Jolla Cove, and he also walked in Balboa Park. So you just have to think about that, that 1975, I think he was here, something like that. And here we are, however many years, that half a century almost later, his grand disciples are going out to Balboa Park and distributing, and La Jolla Cove, where he walked, and distributing his books. It's very, very sweet. Just as a sidelight about Balboa, Balboa Park, those of us who know it, who know Balboa Park, uh, Guna Grimers told me this. Prabhupada's walking in Balboa Park, no, it's Bhakti Das told me, it's Bhakti Das. And Prabhupada said, that, the devotee said, Oh, Prabhupada, it's just like Vrindavan. <laughs> Prabhupada said, No, it is like Dwarka. Because <laughs> if you think, it's got all those big palatial buildings. So, you know, they got Havelis, Vrindavan is what, well. as someone who actually knows, <laughs> Prabhupada made it very clear. No, 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 it's like Dwarka. So, if you want to know what Dwarka looks like, you can go to Balboa Park. At least a shadow. Okay. Anyone else want to make an offering? Uh, what about Ram Viri? Just say what's from your heart. I mean Ram Vilas. Ram Vilas? Come on, Ram. <laughs> Looks like he's ready with something. He's just yeah, he's ready. No, he's just it's cumulative. I'm much younger than many of the senior devotees here, so I beg forgiveness if I speak something wrong in advance to that. <clears throat> so whenever I chant the Prana Mantra of Srila Prabhupada, we chant Namo Vishnu Pada, Krishna Prasthaya Padale, Srimate Bhaktivedanta Samanita Namane, Namaste Saraswate Deve, Gauravani Pracharini, Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarini. It always occurs to me that Srila Prabhupada is not just a Paschacha Deshatarini, who is deliverer of uh, people from the Western countries, his Jagat Tarini. So as, uh, as of uh, now what I'm speaking, uh, like there was uh, uh, something going on in India, in the way, South, South India, that they have a big murti installation of Sri Ramanuja Charya. And uh, on one of the uh, venues, one of the Sri Vaishnava Acharya said that Ramanuja Charya is Jagat Guru. And then there is a whole great debate going on between all the Sampradayas fighting of who is Jagat Guru. So, yes. <laughs> Jagat Guru, like um, who is the Guru of the Guru of the world. But I can very confidently say, as a grand disciple of Srila Prabhupada, that Srila Prabhupada is a Jagat, Jagat Guru who not just gave one speech and uh, impressed people of the Western countries and then just went away, like some of the people who are pro 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 like pro who calls themselves as the proponents of Vedanta philosophy but he also has an accept, uh, as an aspect of bhakti his Srila Prabhupada is mo both bhakti and Vedanta where 
not only just his scholarship is what he gave but also through his personal uh, interactions and uh, you know teachings and personal behavior transformed many of the people who has no introduction about our about the philosophy that's coming uh, from the gaudiya vishnuism and made them into first class uh, devotees that transformation is something which moved me and also uh, one more thing i want to say is whenever we say that srila propada translated many uh, vedic literature uh, gave purports and uh, gave us many books uh, so on and so forth we actually tend to overlook the fact that what prop what srila propad works were is not just uh, like writing some random books or so so the vedic literature is uh, Uh, if we see some of the verses like it appears to me that it's not so easy translating these verses one such verse is uh, when krishna is speaking in bhagavad gita in 269 he says ya nisha sarva bhutani tasyam jagarti samyami yasyam jagarti bhutani sa nisha pasyato muni what is night for all beings in the time of awakening for the self control and the time of awakening for all living beings is night for the introspective sage so these kind of verses is what uh, differentiates between a pure devotee who and what is the intention of the um, devotee and how he is carrying the line of uh, Uh, the parampara that he is coming from uh, and also there are like the srila propats uh, works on uh, isopanishad as well isopanishad is one of the first books that i have read and uh, like it attracted to me so much to the gaudiya vishnuism because we also should uh, one thing which i appreciate from srila propat is his scholarship that is his teachings are very clear there is no ambiguity uh any anyone like if you speak about spirituality tends to use uh, like word jugglery going here and there and uh, you know speaking complicated things and all but when srila propad teaches it's so clear and just straight to the point like when he is speaking about the importance of guru he says tad vignanartham sa guru meva bhigachetaha that if you if you are bewildered and you are if you do not know what to distinguish between what is good and what is wrong one must approach guru and he says the next line then whom like uh, like whom you should approach to when you say uh, to approach guru samit pani srotriyam brahmanishtam shri lu propa tells you must approach to that guru who is brahmanishtam a great devotee so if you say like take the word brahmanishtam and then use all the words and you know confuse the uh, people shri lu propa uh, approach of scholarship is not that he brahmanishtam a great devotee like that there are many verses in the isopanishad like say yes to uh, like there there are these uh, uh, words like atma um, the words like atma brahman all these things uh, it's not just uh, you know this just direct transliteration of that word in english but you should know in the context of it being spoken one such verse is yastu sarvani bhutani atmanyeva anupasyati sarva bhuteshu ch atmanam tatvana vijugupsate it is in the isopanishad uh, text 6 which says so he who systematically sees everything in relation to the supreme lord who sees all living entities as his parts and parcels and who sees the supreme lord within everything never hates anything or any being and also there are some verses uh, in isopanishad which is like kind of riddles like you, you, you can see tad ejati tan naijati tad dure tad dvantike tad ejati means that which is far atad ejati that which doesn't move tan naijati that which moves tad dure that which is far tad dvantike that which is close so like this uh, you know like some kind of riddly language will be there but srila prabhat's translation if you see it is so straight um, the supreme lord walks and does not walk he is far away but he is very near as well he is within everything and yet he is outside everything so it's so simple from uh, from any uh, from people coming from any background to understand what is the philosophy of gaudiya vishnuism and what can we practically take and implement in our lives uh, such c- teachings are clear and that's what uh, which uh, uh, which i'm grateful of shri laprapat and thank you very much from the last very unique and wonderful <laughs> perspective so i'm i'm not going to start calling on people specifically and you know pushing them if they don't have any 
thing. But I think we should probably move on to the Pushpanjali, the Kirtan, and Prasadam. Is that okay? Okay. So, all rise. <laughs>